without we uh, spending too much more time, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Uh, I'm going to start with Sanjay, who's in Bombay, uh, who founded his eponymous firm in 1992, which now stands at a strength of 72, um, and listed among leading architects worldwide by organizations such as Art Daily and Architizer. Sanjay Buri Architects has received more awards than one can keep track of, be it the WAC, World Architecture Festival, The Plan, LEAF and 250 others that include 160 international awards and over 100 national awards. The practice has won architecture projects in Spain, Montenegro, Mauritius, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Montreal, Oman, Dallas and 40 other Indian cities with diverse portfolio of townships, schools, hotels, retail and office buildings, they continue their quest for creating innovative design solutions that are sustainable on a large scale. Their focus lies in evolving design solutions that are contextual and creating spaces that revolutionize the way they are experienced from the essence of the firm's design philosophy. Sanjay, it's an honor to have you here and it's such a pleasure to welcome you. Um, We've kind of, we've had our own experiences over the years, but it's really interesting to be talking to you about the business of architecture today. So welcome. Thank you very much, Mary Anthony. Thank you. So, um, uh, Smita Gupta is the Director of India Operations at Gensler. She is responsible for project management within the country and coordinates between Gensler's uh, partners in India and its teams in the US. Gensler's global team reimagines the future of cities as unprecedented challenges drive us towards a critical time of transformation is what they say. And Gensler's purpose is to create a better world through the power of design. I love that. Um, and comes to life across 26 practice areas, client relationships, global network of leaders and diversity of talent. And Smita offers a highly um, uh, valued combination of experience in strategic planning, workplace design and building architecture. And uh, by working closely with clients and designers to integrate project goals through the design and documentation process, Smita has developed a holistic approach to project understanding and delivery. Thank you, Smita, for joining us. Thank you. And <clears throat> we've got um, Akshat Bhatt, who is the principal architect at Architecture Discipline, um, which is a New Delhi-based multidisciplinary design practice that was founded in 2007. His work spanning varied typologies from residential <clears throat> and retail interiors to large-scale public and commercial assignments, which is also spread across the length and breadth of India. <coughs> Sorry. Um, these highlight the emergence of an architectural expression that is contemporary, yet rooted in a critical understanding of regionalism. Notable projects include a town hall and sales office for the Parthia city township in Bangalore, ongoing refurbishment projects for the Oberoi Group's properties in Agra and Kolkata, and the JDH Urban Regeneration Project, which aims to restore the historic walled city of Jodhpur to its former glory. Akshat also represented India on the global front with the Make in India Pavilion at Hanover in 2015, which was adjudged the best pavilion in the 65-year history of the Messe. His work is published extensively and has won many accolades, in including the NDTV DAA Awards and citations from the Alliance Française and the Government of India. Again, a pleasure to have you with us, Akshat. Um, it's interesting, we were just talking a minute ago. Akshat was my first employee, employer, sorry, and I was his first employee. And uh, about close to 20 years later, we've got you and we are talking about how you've gone from a small little office in the garage of a, an LIG housing uh, community to now having your own big setup in a posh colony in Delhi. So um, if I can ask you to just kind of map your journey, tell us how you've come to this point. And um, if we can start the conversation by each one of you telling us what you've kind of experienced over the years from the time that you graduated and, you, and you've now established yourself as practitioners and we can take the conversation from there. So if Akshat, if you'd like to start. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I, I came back, uh, you know, from my studies in the UK and having worked there for a while in 2001. And, you know, it was right after the Millennium Commission uh, project. So uh, we were, you know, architecture at that time was everyday conversation. Uh, so people were talking about how the Millennium Bridge was swaying. I mean, Foster and Partners was sort of embroiled in two controversies. One was the Millennium Bridge and how it was shaking. And the other was mm -hmm. uh, how the walls of the British Museum were too white. The, the British Museum library extension were too white. Um, and of course, there were many others. So, 
uh, you know and in those days people didn't have mobile phones and they weren't always plugged in so there was a lot of conversation in the tubes about what is going on in the city it it sort of got me hooked i think you know when you start having uh, when architecture becomes everyday conversation amongst uh, people in a city it just it just takes on a different life and a different meaning uh, so when i came back i came back with you know this ambition to um, to sort of address architecture through my uh, you know through what was sort of uh, my understanding of it which was firmly rooted in the idea of british high tech because those are the those are the guys that i was inspired by and the ones that i followed um and also understanding that architecture goes beyond just architectonics it also goes into the space in between and that's it's the space in between buildings where cities happen and i mean i always thought there was tremendous potential for that in india so i came back and i started working for a few practices um, i was junior partner uh with uh, in a practice where the principal was within and he was i think 25 years older than i am i've just given away with his age <laughs> but uh, um and uh well after working together for a few years uh we i realized that um you know i had a lot of things to say and um and it was probably better if i said them on my own and 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 uh, not sort of uh, either dilute someone else's statements or not dilute, dilute mine um and uh, well before i did that i started looking for a moderate or large scale practice that was an equal opportunity practice in india <laughs> which i didn't find um uh, and also after after a while looking um architecture discipline just kind of happened and um it, it happened as a fait accompli because we, we didn't find anyone else i had learned i think from i was reluctant to start because i'd learned from my earlier days that you know while you know an architectural creative journey is is an intense and fun one one that we are groomed for the journey of an entrepreneur is not one that i would wish upon anyone <laughs> why do you say that uh well i think i think it it's 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 a fairly i think to begin with i mean look uh, let's put it another way that you know when i started in 2007 and even before that when you know i was pretty much running a practice so the it, the architecture wasn't as streamlined and structured as it is today i think it's either streamlined and structured today or we're just a part of a different world that is a lot more streamlined and structured and respectful right so the the and you if you if you if you start referencing this the world over you know even if you go to youtube and start searching for people talking about how to start an architecture practice you'll see how difficult that journey is because the the, the barometer of a success of good architecture is not money you know is not the business of architecture i mean and again like when you i think this this the 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 title of this talk the business of architecture is a double entendre because architecture has a, has a business side to it Mm-hmm. and architecture has something that it has to do as a business a function to perform right so yeah. i look at it as that and um and, so and, I, and i think talking about both of them we would yeah. like to kind of address both these issues as mm-hmm. the conversation goes ahead <clears throat> uh so I, i so you know you know from the entrepreneurial journey that the success rate is low uh, and uh, i think that the issue with india is that your the um the entry barrier is actually quite easy you know because we have a fairly large audience and we have a diverse uh, um uh, a diverse mm-hmm. audience that we can address so the the benchmarks for starting out are not as difficult um so it's it's very easy to sort of within your first couple of years start out and get somewhere but it's very hard to then get beyond that to a more meaningful scale in architecture where you're really contributing mm. uh, yeah. and i think yeah uh, i think i think it it can be seen in the you know especially with now with a lot of visual references available easily which weren't in my time and probably weren't uh, yeah well i don't want to say anything else but sure they weren't really <laughs> it was difficult to find in my time i was going to take a jab at sanjay but <laughs> they were <laughs> they were uh, they were they were hard like we had to write mails and letters to people and get physical uh, photocopy documents to sort of look at drawings and reference buildings and you know proportioning systems and construction details and what not which also gave us a sense of rigor uh but i think what you can see now is there is definitely a better visual presence for the for interior architecture in our space and maybe a little bit for architecture that happens between beyond 
within a boundary wall but not what happens beyond it so let me bring in smita over here because smita you you're doing a lot of um, interior work especially right gensler is doing a lot of that work but tell us a little bit about how you kind of reached gensler and your journey with them for over two decades sure thing and it's you know there's so many cues in what akshat's been saying we are on the opposite end of the spectrum Mm-hmm. not that we didn't our start was the same thing as you akshat it was art gensler a founder uh meeting um the founder of gap on a beach and uh, he needed an architect he had a two person shop he sec- sent the second person over to help uh the founder of uh, gap and we've uh, been working with gap ever since so we are over 55 years old now and we are 5500 people somehow we are in in the fives in the year 2020 and so how do you go the idea of scale how do you go from a two person practice the uh, second person uh, the third person was the office manager was art's wife and that's how the firm started but here we are at 5500 how have we been able to scale and this is we don't have any engineers this is all design professionals um So how do you do that it's been a journey and you're right i think art was more of an entrepreneur maybe than he was an architect although he was a very uh, good architect he he'd been trained so he had a very good eye but he was i think even a better businessman so i think you're right the entrepreneurship uh, piece is not taught and sometimes it comes from within so let's go go back to my journey i um, actually come from a business family and the uh you know how it is when you fall in love you uh, have absolutely it doesn't have to make sense and that was me in architecture um and you know some it's so uh, cliched but some of it was ayn rand who i completely deplore now but at the time i did read fountain head when i was 12 and somehow that sowed the seed for architecture and i lived in jaipur that really helped because i was surrounded by architecture it it Uh, actually colors your life and if you have any sensitivity to it even small things matter mm-hmm. so it 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 was you know all those things were coming together uh, i had some friends whose uh, fathers were architects so i saw that side of that life uh, of an architect uh, and uh, you know i persuaded my parents to let me think about architecture i started actually at jj in bombay and went only for a month so this is the other side that comes in and uh, that i got a scholarship to study computer information systems and this is a long time ago if i give you the date i will date myself completely but this is back in mid the mid 80s uh and that was an up and uh, developing field and we didn't know exactly what that meant so i came to the states to study com- computer information systems um and, and i'm telling the story with a point but the love the uh, the first love for architecture actually read it said again i finished my bachelor's and then in the us it's possible to get to switch and get a masters in architecture they call it a first professional degree it takes a bit longer three and a half four years to get uh, your masters in architecture which i uh, uh, went on to do and i really felt like i had found my home i um, the 360 degree education if i say nothing there's a lot of young people on the call i say the the education of architecture I would wish that on everybody because it teaches you systems thinking. I had systems thinking from my computer days as well, but architect the design thinking that I learned uh, in my 4 years, so all of these streams sort of came together. And in some ways I had practiced in um uh, Chicago for a while, but at uh, Gensler I really found the right home for me because it uh, it uh, absorbed all the parts of the way um uh, uh the way i thought because it wasn't just design and uh, but uh, the business piece that comes from my family that being an entrepreneur is just natural to me and then uh the systems thinking that i learned at, uh with computers uh the four years that i studied um, um information systems that all just came together really nicely at gensland we were encouraged to bring our whole self to work which we still do and uh, there was a uh, there was a way to do that so i uh, you know at gensler for 5 years i was doing just interiors and uh, that was great because in chicago i was doing core and shell uh, then i learned how to do interiors which is a slightly different discipline even how you dimension drawings is different in interiors which akshat and sanjay will uh, 
tell and I, I'm hoping that some of the this is a, a architectural uh, audience and they'll understand what I'm talking about and then I uh, realized that I am solving problems that I don't know who has defined the problem this is my systems thinking coming in so there was a discipline called uh, consulting and strategy within Gensler and I, I just saw that and I was like this is what I want to do I don't want to solve problems that I don't know uh, what has been the uh, the brief how has the brief come about so I switched to consulting and strategy within Gensler and that was basically studying the client their organization uh, their portfolios of uh, real estate and uh, solving uh, defining the brief challenging the client on what they thought the problem was and uh, defining the brief so the the designers could solve it and that really is uh, you know where uh, where everything comes together for me all the uh, design thinking good architecture is not precluded by defining the brief correctly which uh, akshat and sanjay were both um, uh, attest to but you're actually solving the right problem so uh, that said you know gensler is a business architect they are business architects. We are the largest design firm in the world. And we've been able to do it because we believe for any design problem, our client is a partner. It's because if we do not solve their issue, what, and we have to get to the bottom of that issue, then we have not done our job right. Design, uh, bringing the right design, bringing the right techniques, that is a given, that is a base. But you have to understand the issue that will make the client successful. If we are solving for retail, we need to understand all the whole uh, business for the client and solve it in a 360 de degree fashion. Um, Renanali, you mentioned we've been doing a lot of interiors. Yes, um, a lot of our business is, is that. So uh, this is a really interesting fact. This is um, um, uh, uh, Art Gensler in 1965, uh, the Embarcadero, which is a big office complex, was being built in San Francisco at the time. And, you know, he just had this, he was a young man, and he had this um, epiphany that at the time, the interiors of these buildings were just, uh, the, it was an office complex, uh, was designed by secretaries and um, wives of bosses. And he's like, well, this building is getting built. It's going to be around for a hundred years, but the interiors will have to be redone every five years or something like that. He's like, that's the business I want to be in. And he didn't come to it by chance. He'd been working with Bank of America and uh, he so basically invented uh, or thought about or gave discipline to the idea of uh, workplace interiors. And so the firm is, uh, you know, deeply rooted in that. That is just the start between that and retail. But now we do everything. As you mentioned, Rajshri, we have uh, 26 practice areas and that goes all the way from urban planning to aviation uh, to brand design. So, or, you know, architecture certainly and uh, interiors. And then also we do brand design and graphic design. So we, we like to say, you know, from the Shanghai Tower, second tallest building in the world, to a wine label bottle, a, a six by six uh, wine label uh, bottle. The scale is immense, 5,500 people. How do you keep all these people together is really interesting. So I, I like to uh, look at uh, Gensler as if you have uh, read the book Moneyball, Michael Lewis's Moneyball, it's about finding niche players and giving everybody celebrating their niche um, expertise and herding all these cats together and uh, making sure that they can shine in their little niche um, development so everybody doesn't have to do everything so to answer your question uh, to, to your uh, issue akshat we didn't learn entrepreneurship but there are people who are really good at entrepreneurship and understand design how do you partner them with people who have no idea how to run the business, but are excellent designers? And basically, Gensler is built on that platform. And, uh, you know, there are some guiding principles, etc. So uh, my journey has now become entangled with uh, Gensler. I've just been there for long enough, even though I left for five mm -hmm. years to go uh, do the strategy and consulting from the client side, which was an incredible uh, opportunity. Uh, I was responsible for, uh, I was part of a team responsible for developing the capital plan for Genentech, 
which is a um you know very strange career it's a biotech firm one of the um, old the oldest biotech firm and how do you uh, understand science well enough to understand what they will need in terms of facilities in 10 years but it was an incredible journey because i built almost over 2 million square feet worth 2 billion dollars in 5 years because we had an incredible run of uh, biological success so bringing all that back then back to uh, um, establishing an india practice uh, for gensler it's uh, really been an amazing journey but it's been almost uh, more business uh, than opposite to akshat than design for me personally but it's business and strategy that uh, helps me to engage with amazing synthetic minds so i find that i'm a much more analytical brain Uh, i know what ne- i can figure out what needs to be done i can see when it's not done right but i need partners to do the synthesis and so um you know recognizing that um uh, i can do i'm only part of the problem has been um, amazing it's been a successful uh, it's been the driver for my success because that, we are going to come we are, we are going to come back to you back. because you yes, yes, covered a absolutely. lot of uh, things in you know yes. and it's been wow it's been overwhelming to listen to you you sorry, perhaps sorry sorry uh, no 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 we are we're delighted we just want to split up so the audience can get you know um information from everyone and collate it and then you absolutely. know get what they want absolutely. but it's been amazing and perhaps you are at a unique position in that that you already came from a background of business and then you went into this corporate uh, situation which kind of strained your your progress further in your career um sanjay um, um adding to this um 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 so um my question is can you be an effective uh, architect without uh, the basic understanding of the business and architecture what has been your journey hey, to be very very frank i am a very very bad businessman i am really, really bad and uh, this profession is such you know that it's it's just so purely passion driven that there are times when the project sounds so exciting it could be a tiny house somewhere but that location is sitting on a contoured hill on the top looking down at a valley and this guy is saying you know i just want to make a 2500 square feet house and you do it because i think you know with your profile it looks like a tiny job but i'm saying like no i really want to do it and then you know fees goes aside and everything goes aside and you just get so excited by the plot and what you could do in that location that you forget everything else so i think you know business wise architects in general are really bad and we really need to have a business partner still i don't have one and i wish i found the correct person to have as a business partner because i really don't want to get into the business of things you know if and yet you've been highly successful sanjay you couldn't have done that you should have had the growth you did and hire this amazing set of uh, young architects if you didn't know the business aspect of it as well so i think you're underplaying that that um, that um, you know particular intelligence that you have in in the business acumen as well um now you know i'm um, coming back to the practice itself now there's so much of technology employed in uh, architecture now now so many digital tools Uh, so when you actually hiring um uh, new recruits are you looking for you know people with passion as yourself when you you came into the business and continue to have that passion or are you looking um uh, to hire people that have these digital skills because now everyone's working on the computers there's every kind of software available so really um how much value is it to you know this whole um um design intelligence that necessary or the passion that is necessary any more i mean how much how what is the percentage of um, relevance uh, that you would give to creativity in a in a new hire so i think you know even today it's 80% is still you're looking for the passion in the person and it's not about all the other skills of how well you can draw and how well you know your software is that still comes for me that still comes secondary so i am still looking at 80% do you have the passion and if that person has the passion then you look at the other aspects okay great presentation is also good and you know the like he's really good at rhino or she's really good at something else so but that, all of that is secondary i it's completely the, second yeah i completely second what you're saying sanjay yeah i think Although i think i'm uh, looking at all the other aspects as well but i don't know somehow 
you just get caught up in that whole thing that is the person passionate or not and you know that overrides everything else akshay you were saying something no, i i think working in an architectural practice is like a is like continuing professional development throughout right you don't that, that never stops so um, we have these little one liners for ourselves and we always we when when we're interviewing people which i don't do anymore uh, it's always the studio looking to see uh, if someone fits in and for us the, the 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 how you start is by saying you know skills can be taught because for the first 3 4 5 6 months that's what you're doing and you're doing that as you go along but mm-hmm. character you either have or you don't have mm-hmm. so we're only looking for that we're looking for individuals who can bring something to the studio and that doesn't have to do with your skill set or your architectural training it's got to do with who you are and what what you really are as a personality but if i, I, I could not over here um sorry just to kind of continue uh, akshat your sort of train of thought that when you talk about personality it's one thing to be passionate like sanjay said right you're looking for somebody who's passionate about the subject about architecture itself but today like you're also saying that it's important to build a structure which can allow you to propagate your business the business of your studio and your practice so <laughs> do you look for people who have the acumen um who who are like over uh, or well rounded in that respect or are you looking for people who are passionate on one hand so they're going to you know run the design part of the studio and you're looking for another set of people who are going to run the the business part of the studio so i i think i think um, um, we are never looking for a one dimensional person right mm-hmm. remember that these each each individual who's sitting in your studio is uh, for a studio our size we're about 25 people so um each person is kind of is a is an ambassador for your studio itself right it's yeah. an energy and um it's a flat organization uh, so it's a flat outfit it's not really an organization uh unlike gentlemen and possibly sanjay who lied about his business acumen but uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but um you but, but i think we are we're always looking for people who fit in and who contribute now you're not looking at it as a business development device at least i'm not or or, or the studios not that's not what what we get get for and we're fortunate enough to not have to depend on it you know uh, really all the time it's not our focus uh but it is about uh bringing some sort of vibe of the city in and taking our vibe out um so uh, it's never the it's never the uh, the ambition when you first meet someone but if they develop into being a potential person who can go out and look for new work or 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 sort of or identify new avenues then that happens over the over a couple of uh, over a certain amount of time in the studio itself right but the core the core first engagement of the studio with an individual is that of being a designer and that's kind kind of yeah go ahead sorry um i was just saying sanjay you have previously mentioned how you because you started off your practice and correct me if i'm wrong um you started off working with hafiz contractor while you were still in school and you continued working with him and then after that you kind of set off on your own with a developer who offered you a particular project and because you started off working with a developer you kept getting more and more projects that were developer driven and it was a little bit of a challenge for you to come out of that little pigeon hole right of working with developers and doing these large scale um sort of development projects whereas you have enjoyed doing smaller and more uh different perhaps more intimate projects as well so was it like can you tell us a little bit about this i don't know if it was a struggle really but for you to diversify your practice and be able to do different kinds of things in the process oh so yeah so I actually started working with Hafiz when I was 18 and not even joined college then. So it was prior to joining college. So I had already done working drawing with clients gone to sites, managed sites prior to going to college first year. Wow. So anyway, there's a different thing. So you so were like the perfect candidate for somebody to join an office. He just copied Norman Foster's life. <laughs> <laughs> After reading Fountain Head, I believe. Well, he's very smart. That's a good life to copy. so like you said you know going into that uh, so my first project which is actually a very large project i mean there's projects like that to start your office with it was 3000 apartments 54 acres 
apartment, school, everything, the works, and we were doing the entire urban planning as well. So I mean, that's like that was a huge break. So yes, but because of that break, the downside was that we just kept getting developer after developer after developer. There was literally a point where uh, I was doing projects in every western suburb, right? And for every single builder who was building there, and you know that effort to try to you know get something different was just not happening because people never considered it that way. They said, "Oh, this guy is for you know the developer kind of architect." So it just oh, it took a long time to get that first break where we did the very interesting food court in Donabla, and then uh, we won a competition to do a leisure center, which was just a fifteen thousand square feet building, but it was very very interesting. In the Ambi Valley, which is like a three-hour drive from Bombay, and so slowly, slowly the shift happened, and then we started focusing on trying to get those jobs. So it took a long period. So we are still doing developer projects now, also, but that is now only thirty percent of our actual work. The rest of the work, which involves schools and houses and all other kinds of buildings. So yeah, it took a long time, and I mean, it took a really long time. It was a struggle. But that you know, you're you're doing a lot of different works now, a lot of diverse projects now. So it's it's paid off, right? Yes, it did. <laughs> Raj, you know what um, what um, what was very intriguing for me was listening to Smita talk about Gensler's. You know, um, large. I mean, they're a large corporate today, and uh, you know, she said they're even coming down to designing a label. So they really they are a design company. They, I mean, from her conversation, it seems that. Far more a design company as an identity than an architecture firm, and 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 she also said they hire designers and not architects. Now, you know, I mean, it's very different from the way um, Akshat and Sanjay and other you know Indian architecture firms work, because you actually are hiring architectural graduates with engineering degrees and so on. So, um, how different is how different is the environment that you work in? How different is um, you know how uh, it's a perception of an architecture firm in india akshat um and and smita you also work out of india six months yeah. a year you know so, so i'll just say that gensler would be appalled if they heard that they were being called a corporate <laughs> and, oh. and frankly i have worked for a corporation and they are not corporate they are definitely a design firm they are made up of small studios and it's it's really organic they would be appalled yes there is a framework we call it the platform um that everybody can plug into but they they are uh, i guess they are a little bit more corporate than uh, perhaps the smaller firms but frankly they are primarily a design firm and i would say a majority of the people are trained architects and interior designers and then there are others who join as well you know other adjacent uh, fields as well so over to aksha i well i think what i understand is that you guys scale beyond a point and then you bring it, there is diversity that comes in either organically yes. or it's sort of doctored in and um and uh it's a bit like looking at a fashion house right where where the chief fashion designer it's you know there's there's a lot of uh there's a lot of machinery that's actually looking after the business end of that of that of that design studio allowing the designers to be independent so i i i think there was a time then one would look down upon a large scale firm or organization as say oh well they're not innovative or creative enough or you know uh sort of um, or, or 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 outfit like enough or sort of you know hands on enough but that's been proven wrong over the last couple of decades clearly i mean and i think it was really because in the even in the 80s uh you know a good studio was at the most 35 people studio but today when you look at a foster and partners or a bjark angles or 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 or, or, or yeah, you know or gensler you know these guys are behemoths and uh, they are running delivery structures but that doesn't just mean that they are stuck in that yes you will see a lot of output which is a certain kind and you can say well it's just output but if you look at all the smaller studios do, generating work you'll see that there is that sort of similarity anyway the, the 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 space for innovation and true innovation is uh, and and true contribution through design is limited you can't you can sometimes just overdo it and sort of have an academic contribution of some level uh, which which is or or esoteric contribution but 
but but i think um, i think i've grown to appreciate how large studios tend to or large organization and large studios tend to work um, there's a lot to learn there what's happening is that the minute a studio goes beyond a certain scale it's termed commercial right and i don't necessarily understand why so today uh, the perception is that if you are a large scale studio you're commercial and the minute you're termed commercial you're termed less creative is that something that you all feel not at all no, and at you know all. i i would like to address that because that is something that we face all the time hmm. and talk about passion projects uh, the first time i came to bangalore i drove by the opera house it was a derelict building it was sitting over there uh, you know completely uh, boarded up uh, 10 years down the road samsung actually rented that building and we had a chance to work on that sanjay we made no money on it but it was a passion project that we did uh in bangalore and it adds so much to the city so the passion doesn't go out uh akshat i you know i was going to say to you i'm so sorry that we were not there uh when you were looking for a uh, outfit like ours to plug into because we were the right place for you because we want to harness your passion and give in, give you all the other support to do your best work and so and not at all i i just don't like this idea of commercial if commercial means that we uh do well by doing good then yes we want to be commercial but uh the passion doesn't uh it is not reduced by even an iota yeah i th- i think i think we have to somehow start disassociating commercial success from poor work right and mm-hmm. yeah. would you would you judge exactly so, i mean if you if you google foster and partner it's the number one place to work and it's the number one studio uh, one one of, and it's the number one studio in in the architectural communities uh, you know in terms of respect so why would you say that like how could we how can they proven it like is it enough other richard rogers partnership 700 people right so we uh, i i think we tend often we tend to sort of do that to shield ourselves to say no you know to sort of put blinkers on ourselves you know in a in a sort of almost a socialist way i'm sorry if i'm offending anyone but almost to sort of say that hey you know commercial success is not good commercial success means you're compromising somewhere no you're not uh, if you're using that to harness some other kind of energy um then you're definitely not and it's a, and it's a good thing you are doing this you are in this profession for profit right you're not in it as a charitable organization you know we have to find success for yourself so yeah question. sanjay how mean, would you sanjay, define no. success for yourself hmm. do you do you feel that your practice has been successful over the years yes it has been successful to an extent but not to the extent uh, that i wanted it to be because there were a number of designs that we had done like 15 years ago which never saw the light of day every day i mean seriously they were at that time really ahead of time but you know each time it was the client said no this is too much or this is you know what this, they were just not convinced so i think we lost a lot of opportunity but that it was not that we did something to lose it it was just that it did not happen for other reasons so it would have been way more successful so sanjay are you equating your idea of success um by the the kind of design projects that you seem uh, to be disappointed that didn't materialize um yeah. so yeah you're, you're you're equating your success to passion in that sense and not commerce because certainly you are commercially commercially a very successful architecture firm but you still feel this now isn't doesn't that some, have something to do with the client landscape um in india as well um isn't it about Absolutely. raising the bar of awareness of what is good architecture bad architecture and and um, respecting the architect and his creativity yeah Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit on that Sanjay? Yeah. Right. So I really do that. You know, people think that okay, you know, and I've been told this. Oh, you got it easy. You got this. You got that. It's so easy for you to convince clients. It's it's not at all easy. You know, the amount of time you spent convincing a client fifteen years back, you're still doing it every, even now with every single project almost. Yeah. Just those few, very few, who come saying that okay, you know, this guy has done this and he has done that, which is so different. I'll leave it to them, but that's so rare. It's like one in fifty, sixty maybe. But the balance forty-nine 
you still need to convince 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 at every point at the design time the budget time for getting a good contractor for not compromising i think in india if you manage to construct a project the way you emphasized it in the beginning you should get an award for that itself because you have to deal with a client who changes his mind and this is like a indian thing you know you think you know you can keep changing it's okay so what you can keep changing and you know every few months you can change and every second month you can change and you can see less lead to get really to get how how often you do it you are wasting your money don't they get it so that's a then to find the correct contractor okay so there are some contractors who understand but then that client doesn't want that contractor but maybe their contract is expensive or maybe that contractor is far away maybe doesn't have that manpower to do it in the same speed so there are all these other factors so then you have to deal with a contractor only who's not good to start with and then make sure because here in india you have a contractor who thinks he knows it all also in spite of not having done enough work or that kind. so there are these challenges at every single point here but sanjay tell me don't you think that you know with with your years as a as a studio and with the kind of provenance you have uh, while i understand every time you're doing a new typology you and you're up against your competition you if you're sort of in a competition or if you're pitching or some such you have to prove your worth or you have to prove the metal of your ideas but a lot of what you're saying seems to have to do with contract administration which is like your change logs that you're talking about are your own studios contract administration then when you talk about how you deal with a contract or a third party who's actually responsible for delivering your your project in in a physical form then it's about you know helping a client project manager contract administer i feel often we tend to confuse in india we tend to confuse or i feel often we tend to get overburdened by certain expectations that we shouldn't have and that clouds our ability to to choose the right partners or the right people to work with no no akshar that aside that of course is part of it no but the main thing is that clients yet have to be convinced to do a design that is slightly different also i mean they just want to do it oh this is uh, oh it's i mean i'm just saying a simple thing okay just few days back Oh, this building got too many curves. The shuttering will be too expensive. Why don't you make a straighter design? You're not seeing what you're achieving by the design. You're achieving fluid. You're achieving spaces that flow into each other. They're not interested in that. They are only interested in how you can cut cost at all time. So it starts with the client problem first. You still have to spend so much time convincing a client to do what you want to do. Contract. I have with- yeah. I have a question on you know the building process itself. um uh, do most architects uh firms um you know bill on an hourly basis or on a project fee basis uh because you know if what you're saying is uh, is true and i know it's true that yeah. uh you know clients keep changing and changing so if you charge just the project fee you're just losing out on your resources yeah losing out all the time by the way and although the, there is a clause that if you repeat the design once it is frozen and you've gone to a certain stage or if you finish the working drawing and then you change the design the design stage will be built again the working drawing stage will be built again but clients in india are just not ready to pay they just not ready to pay so there are very few to be fair there are a few who say okay they accept that okay but that also they'll accept that okay i got you i got the design changed four times i'll pay once is never happens up till now in our career has never happened that somebody has paid for every change they made and we have the you know man hours and all of that also written in the clauses but it is never followed no client does nita is Sad this something true. that you notice happening more in india as opposed to other parts of the world no i think it's uh, it's an asia wide issue it's not just india we see this yeah, yeah it's asia wide and uh, i think it's a little bit more in the west it's a little bit more structured and i think that's probably why uh, because there are professionals on the client side as well so it's not perhaps the owner himself somebody who's doing a project for the first time maybe they don't understand uh, this and they haven't factored uh, these kind of things in uh, sanjay we've been you know and that's perhaps sometimes having the uh uh the heft that we do sometimes it helps we've been able to get some additional services for design changes uh but you're right i think it's a struggle and uh, so uh, 
believe me it's not easy the only thing we can do is to have a very uh defined process and then you're right they will make the changes even when the design drawings are done and what will process do at that point uh you know i think uh, that's where making sure that the brief and the story and this is where storytelling comes into all of this that the, the story of the project is well established so the changes that be that are being requested you can at least challenge them to a certain extent but you're right th- this issue does exist you seem to have had a, a different sort of set of experiences sorry so you seem to have had a different set of experiences Me? with your clients yeah um yes i i think um i i i i mean i i understand where sanjay is coming from and i and i actually agree with uh, smita as well but i think uh, i have to say that we've been lucky that way that we have been able to have some clarity of stage uh, or on documentation it is it is very hard to build man hours in india because there is a certain there is a learning curve that's happening within smaller studios all the time and so there is no real man hour definition uh, there's a lot of inefficiency because we're all addicted to our mobile phones i think a lot more than the, than we than people are exactly yeah. yeah um and there, so there was a time when i would actually I, we would actually request everyone to leave their phones on you know at the reception and then if they received a call the receptionist would would sort of uh, would hand the phone out or or help them out with whatever communication they had to do so that uh it was there but you weren't missing out um there seems to be this so i think that mobile phone addiction is is a problem in india but uh but i think stage clarity is something that we have been able to achieve it's not and and it has to do with the seriousness of the project uh mm-hmm. the clarity of the brief of course the clarity of the program the critique of the program as you receive it the understanding of the area statement as you receive it which is a lot of those processes are short changed in studios in india because we're just so eager to get onto the drawing board and start to start sort of re, you know throwing out something that 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 we can innovate we have had terrible experiences on a few projects where we wasted a lot of time just trying to prove an incorrect area statement as a ego tussle with unfortunately a professional on the client side and it's it's so it works both ways um i think that it has to do with a lot of contractual clarity i have been appalled to see some one page two page contracts that mm-hmm. that my colleague my 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 colleagues have sort of shown to me from their their studios say hey this can't possibly be a professional services agreement you know um uh, so we we sort of i think i i think i pride myself in being able to have arrived at a fair agreement that works both ways and we we really 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 uh do not budge from it you know uh, unless uh, and and if it is budged from then it's always done with lawyers uh, consultation do you think this has something to do with the scale of the project as well okay, the scale yeah. of the client that you're working with where you know you're not getting if you're working with smaller projects or smaller clients then you have direct points of contacts with them uh, whereas if you're working with big you know i kind of refrain i can't <laughs> refrain from saying corporates but you kind of get um tangled in the bureaucracy of just the, the number of people who are involved in this whole process does that happen it's work culture i i think i think it it i think at both scales be, be it a small client or a large client um you know it's work culture so you could work with a very large developer and still get you know still get thrown around on your contract uh, it's mm-hmm. really about so i think clarity has to begin with you you know your cl- the clarity of what service you're going to provide how much time you're going to spend how how quickly do you want to deliver something the time frame of a project you know the the need to investigate or question the brief I, look we are, we're we're a, we're a younger studio so much and 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 definitely not as large as these and as these other two sort of dates but but we do have um we do try and sort of put some value and pay it to our time so that we can uh and we do allow ourselves to get pushed around a bit for the benefit of the project we're not it's not a tra- you see architecture or in design is not a transactional relationship you know it cannot be that but mm. it cannot be a one way street either and i think we we tend to we tend to we we often tend to not have the courage to walk away mm. 
Okay, I'm going to ask you a question on marketing. I mean, um, uh, isn't marketing uh, or shouldn't marketing be an essential uh, part of of your of your business or your your company's, uh, uh, you know, to be to really how there's so many architects and architectural firms that have cropped up everywhere in India, in every city, even in tier two, tier three cities. I often see architecture, uh, you know, practices. Now, how does one go and get these? Um, you know, um, jobs. How what? How do you develop and nurture a client network? How do you go and I mean, as surely you know, all all of you are working. You're working on your creativity, getting these things sorted. But don't you think it's essential to have a, a, a small marketing setup within your own organizations? And maybe you do. So, like building a brand, kind of. You know, the outreach. How do you go and get a job? How do you, how, yeah, until, until you do an amazing, um, no, un, so, until you, yeah, Sanjay. Yes, a, lot of, a lot of architecture firms in India have marketing teams. In fact, I was shocked to hear, first time when I heard it about 10 years back, that this guy used to work in a bowling alley. And so I said, oh, you, you used to deal with that bowling company, right? So now where are you? He said, oh, I'm working with a so-and-so architect in Mumbai. So I said, uh, what are you working with an architect? You give it a, you know, sales Sanjay, we seem to have lost you. Oh, good, marketing. The other day I was in uh, Surat. Sanjay, we are having a few network from. issues with your connection, I think. Uh, so there, there are a lot of architects doing uh, marketing. But we have never done it and we don't have any marketing people. I think when you do a good project, that in itself gives you so many more clients. But Sanjay, it takes a long time to get there to be recognized, you know. Until then, what? Who sells <laughs> yeah. you? Who sells your talent? <laughs> Yeah, let me speak to that a little bit because we are yeah. a large organization and we are a big beast. It has to be fed. Uh, but I completely agree with Sanjay. We don't have, we see a lot of uh, architects having business development uh, individuals on the team. And even with our big behemoths, we do not have uh, business development individuals. So for uh, we, the practitioners, yes, talk to clients. Yes, we are performing that function. Uh, but your best business development uh, technique is your previous project. It's built. It's standing there. So 80% of our business is repeat business. If we do right by our clients the last time, they will come back to us. The second step that we, uh, so we uh, take great pride in the work we do and we make sure that the work is done right. Not that, you know, we don't have bad projects. Everybody does now and then, but our focus is to get the job done right. The second piece is to get thought leadership out there. So what we are thinking, how we in, in four hours like this and others, uh, we, we get uh, our thinking out there. And, you know, then, but when the RFP does come in, there is a mechanic mechanics of uh, responding to all that so for that we do have marketing groups but we do not have a business development group and we if we are able to do that at 5500 people the largest firm in terms of people and revenue then i know that it's not necessary to focus that much on marketing and business development just do your job right Akshat, would you like to add to that well, I I read somewhere that uh, if you do something, you need to talk about it. Um, and I think there's a lot of noise, especially in uh, in India now with uh, publication. Right? There's a lot of that going on. Um, for the, I have to say that for I I think I agree with Smita again that your your work and the personnel in your organization are your business development team. Right? They are the they are both are actually uh, torchbearers for what you do uh, and you need to often get thought leadership out there um, which is what you know i guess now social media and publication does unfortunately publication in india is not critical it's only focused on uh, product or project delivery and it's a descript it's descriptive or or celebratory is not critical so it's it's one dimensional and i think clients understand that as well uh, 
I, for one, am not, we don't have a business development team and I, for one, am an introvert, so I don't network. Uh, um, I have, I have, uh, uh, I take solace in sort of going back and, and sitting amongst my instruments and playing them uh, rather than going out and partying or meeting other individuals. But yes, there are, I think most of the very successful practices out there have very, very aggressive business development teams. And uh, it's, and I do believe that in India, that is appreciated by clients, right? So uh, it's who you are and uh, uh, it's, sorry, it's what you are and who you know here uh, to a large extent. So I think if, if they are a force multiplier because they are screaming out your message out, you know, at least the message of getting more business mm-hmm. or your availability out there. It's not only publications and not only PR firms, right? But various platforms like Smita, you mentioned, even media opportunities and speaking opportunities such as this, for example, this could become an opportunity for each one of you. Um, also awards and competitions, um, attending different things, whether it's, it's Pan India, whether it's international, just being visible creates that brand awareness, right? Now, it's a question of whether you want to create that as an individual or do you want to create that as a company? And I think it kind of, it might work differently in both cases. So Sanjay, for example, your firm is pivoted on your name and on a person, right? Whereas Gensler, on the other hand, is a much larger sort of um, conglomeration, which is, you know, multiple people. And so it's not about knowing that one person who started it, mm-hmm. but as knowing Gensler as a brand. And Akshat, you're kind of sitting maybe, you know, if I can say so, in the middle of the two ends of the spectrum. So... Sanjay, would you like to comment on that? No, no, you're absolutely right. But your your bio does sort of, you know, say that you've got gotten what more than 250 awards across the world. So that definitely says for something, right? Yes. So that that in itself is, uh, yeah, being out there. But neither do we have marketing, and it's I think it's it's a project that gets you more projects. It happens with. Almost all projects. You do one good project and it actually multiplies and gives you, at the very least, five, six more. Yeah, but, but I have to say, Sanjay, I think, I think, like, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Akshay. I think, I think you and Hafiz, contractor, and a couple of others are kind of phenomenons, you know, there in, in India. Uh, you have been around for, you're like, you know, your, your forces to reckon with uh, in terms of your visibility and your and the number of projects you do and the diversity of projects you guys do no one can question it um, so you don't I don't think it like Gensler I don't think you really need to tell the world that you're there because everybody knows you're around come on see we, we are not that big okay you know you guys are making it sound like God knows what they're like 70 people they're not that many big I mean you're comparing to Hafiz who's got like 500 plus people so it's not like that and we are not doing some easy amount of work. We are just doing the kind of work that we can handle and we can take care of and it follows the principles of attention given to detail because you don't want to get that big that you don't know what is happening in the office. So it kept it that way. So it's a conscious decision to not grow more than this? Yeah, it is actually a conscious decision so far. And at what point do you figure yeah. that, okay, you know, I want my studio to be this size and I want my practice mm-hmm. to do only this kind of work. So, you know, especially for a lot of people who are starting their own studios and practices now, it's interesting to see because you might start off saying that, okay, let me do whatever comes my way, right? Because that's how you kind of get the, you set the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. But at what point are you able to define your own values for your own practice? At what point did you say, okay, this is what it's going to be? I think that understanding will come on its own. So, at in the beginning, like in our case, we just took every single thing that came. Okay, literally every single thing. But now it's like, no, you don't want to do that kind of thing. You don't want to do this whole developer thing. And if the project has merit and excitement, then you do it. So, you push to only get those kind of jobs and the other ones you don't show so much interest in. So, you've gradually done that whole shift. So, you, dis- you will realize yourself that there is this point that, okay, is enough of doing everything because you know you cannot make a difference everywhere like let's be fair you cannot in a standard developer project really make a difference especially in bombay with the kind of rules that there are okay so you can only just make it kind of okay and nice you can't do something that is wow because the rules don't permit you to do and the other conditions also don't permit you so you don't want to do that anymore so that the understanding comes it will come 
I, w- I want Akshat and Smita to respond to this, and I want to come back to this mm. whole idea of catering and addressing the market versus yeah. doing what you actually want to do on your own. But uh, Smita and Akshat, if you want to comment on what we talked about earlier, uh, Akshat, you want to go first because I I have a big answer here. We are you know we've gotten to fifty five hundred. We're taking a slightly different approach, though all the constraints are the same. Yes, go ahead, Akshat. I think. Um... I mean, I, I, I would, I would respectfully disagree with Sanjay there. I, I think a, we all have to define for ourselves what, what we mean by differentiator, and what is significantly different enough to be a wow. Uh, b, I think all, at least, uh, we like to believe that our work is rooted in being critical of the program and the typology in itself, and take it on if you can be a differentiator, if you can contribute to being a differentiator in it. Only that way. will there be a repeat for you right uh, here i'm not talking about the mechanism for delivery because the mechanism for delivery has to be unfallible or infallible right you have to do that you have to deliver it is the you know the understanding of a project from conception to completion is uh, you know it goes without saying and the conception has to be that of a differentiator if you want to be heard you know uh, otherwise you're not going to be heard uh otherwise you just need like a lot of numbers to just start coming your way and that happens everywhere in the world you have the numbers uh there will be enough followers who will just sort of follow you it's uh, kind of like a conformist client or what not who will, who will sort of follow you in in that way uh so the only way we've been able to sort of make a mark for ourselves is by being you know distinctly different uh, and that's not different for the sake of being different it's actually just making a critical contribution to the project and you can see that from the our client type of, uh, our client profile as well i mean it's it, they will not you really do have to go out and prove on paper and demonstrate that you know what your you know that that differentiator is different because the those those clients and those projects are those project typologies already have a successful provenance But actually do you feel that you started off in a certain way and therefore you your tra- your trajectory has been like this or did you work towards making it so specifically defined no, I think we were always like that I think I think I think it the stood one of the core principles of the studio was critical intimacy it was okay. never it was never critical dif- dif- difference so um it it started like that it was always about the space in between buildings more than the building in itself i mean that has to happen you have to get your building right like a product or your interior right like a product uh, what did happen as we went along was we started doing a lot of interior work because uh, i think architectural uh, endeavors take fairly long right a- any significant one will be 3 to 5 years and sometimes they fall through the cracks and suddenly you know, so in the first 7 years we had only 3 projects built to show but we worked on 20 you know and they just fall into the cracks there was a recession and what not and we realized we had to start embracing interior work because that would uh, a give us opportunity to test things very quickly and uh, b put uh, also hone our skills and c make a network of projects that were uh, you know that were that were good enough to show to people to say that you know we have delivered a certain scale volume and quality of work yeah so let me take that on and i think for me the answer is in both places uh we've grown organically so we didn't start out if you ask art today which you know he comes to the office still he's 85 years old he comes to the office every day and you will run into him if you are in the uh san francisco uh, san francisco office so if anybody's coming please let me know and i'll make sure you meet him uh he didn't you know where we've ended up is not what we what he envisioned so b- b- the difference is it's the passion and the differentiator of a lot of individuals so for instance you know we, absolutely the, there is passion involved on what you are able to do with your client so we embraced always always we imp- embraced our clients thinking and trying to solve the issue for them not that we did not question the brief we expanded the brief we made it so we solved problems that the client doesn't know that they have or issues we we put a different light on a perspective and that that is the uh, that is part of the joy of what we are able to bring to the table but su- suppose i was um uh, passionate about consulting and strategy so i have been able to grow that business then there was somebody who was passionate about data centers so we do data centers completely different thing 
so this uh, issue i think what sanjay is uh, it's a it's basically our um, um firm is a bunch of sanjay studios and there there are a lot of people that they're not nearly as famous as, as sanjay we call ourselves the constellation of stars so we we don't have one sun but we have a lot of stars who built studios around them around their passions and all of them are thinking the same way they want to do something similar and we can just band together and increase the scale of our work and the scale of the impact and really that's how it's built so we we find that a studio of about 35 is at the maximum as soon as a group gets to be about 35 and 40 around an idea or an issue and or a practice we usually break it up into two studios and then they start to grow again and that's exactly how the firm has grown uh on people's passions and also client relationships so for instance if um chevron takes us to houston we go to houston and then we start a business there and that's that's sort of been our practice and that's how we came to india as well uh sunita you've thrown up something very interesting here so are you saying to all of us that you're a conglomerator of smaller studios that work independently um for instance uh, would you then take over akshit's uh, practice or sanjay's practice not take over but make them partners with gensler to work out of india or work elsewhere and is that how you grown so you are growing with other independent studios um no so we've never taken over a studio we do not acquire zero mna activity for gensler we find okay. it not that we haven't tried it just doesn't work for us uh, it's a very simple philosophy but it is made up of studios and each studio is its own p and in fact every project is a pnl so it it's a team that can be made up of the best individuals from around the firm we have that ability to uh, uh, attract the right people to make up a project but they reside in a home room which is called the studio and the project also belongs in a studio so that's one um sort of um unit of um organization and several studios make an office and several offices make a region so this is just a way of organizing uh, ourselves just so that there is some level of communication um uh, and uh, you know just operational efficiency but um um i'm just trying to so, so we i mean i would love if akshat wants to join a gensler then certainly we'll we'll have a way to do it but it's under the gensler umbrella and the most important thing for us is the gensler culture which absolutely transcends everything else it's a one firm firm in the true sense that we put the firm or the benefit of the entire firm to get you know as much as the individual it's employee owned so every all the profits are not going up to one person um most of the uh, 90% of the profits go back to uh, employees and uh, you know in in these times right now we are going through some uh, tough times um, financially so the people who are uh taken care of best are the most junior people the principals are the ones who which is about i would say 7% 6% of the firm we have taken the biggest cut but we take care of our people it's they have shares in the firm so it really is a collective rather than a conglomerate i would mm. say it's a collective that everybody comes into this platform works together and you know sort of builds on each other's power thank you So um I think I just want to come back to what Sanjay was talking about what he mentioned a little uh, earlier. I know we're running way beyond time um and Sanjay has another commitment so we're going to quickly ask you um about this whole idea of responding to the market what you were talking about earlier right and um whether we should or whether we do this as a response to what is a requirement of the market versus what we want to do. and i know a lot of times you kind of get caught in between this you know it becomes like a conundrum of um what we should do versus what we want to do what is a requirement versus what is a desire and how we draw that balance between the two and sanjay if we can get your thoughts on that and um we will spare you for the rest of the evening <laughs> no i think you got me wrong in the, that last one so it's mm-hmm. not about uh, doing what the market expects you to do ever you never do what the market expects you to do you do what you think is appropriate for that kind of thing yeah some some projects will be market driven for example 
everything is not an individual project and it's not a corporate project and it's not an education project so there are uh, private developers projects but 90% of the architecture that happens in india unfortunately is that but so given that there is a market condition for that particular plot in that part of the city and there is a requirement for that but you have to do whatever is possible in the best possible manner there so is it such that if every good architect starts shunning all these developers the developers will end up going to architects who are totally which means that everybody will be living in a not so greatly designed apartment for the rest of their lives you don't want to do that right so yes so there are projects where you may not make an architectural wonder okay that is what i was trying to say but that does not mean that you can't make it better you yes. have to make it better so under all those circumstances of what the market desires what the developer wants you have to find a middle path and create the best kind of design solution that is possible on that particular plot for that particular location considering the clientele that is going to come and live there there is always something that you can do better so we can't shun yeah. right I also, the projects that are coming your way are determined by the market, right? I mean, there is a market for certain development, and that's what is going to be available, and is that is what is going to be offered to you. It's interesting that you you put it, um, you you said something which almost seems like you're shouldering the responsibility of creating responsible architecture, because mm-hmm. if you don't respond to it, then it mm-hmm. these projects would go to people who perhaps would not be able to do justice to them. Absolutely, do you know? And we all do. Part- I I agree with Sanjay we all do we should take this on it's our yeah, job in the last 7 8 years how many residential towers have been created in bombay where kitchens kitchens don't get natural light and ventilation mm. bathrooms are opening into 2 feet by 5 feet plumbing ducts they have no natural yeah. ventilation do you think that works in india no. why Why would you do that? Why would you make a curtain wall residential building where you can't open the window beyond six inches? <laughs> I mean, that's stupid to another level. Yeah. So this is what is happening everywhere in premium projects, in expensive apartments. If architects like us do not get involved, then that's what's going to happen. I mean, like blind aping of what's happening in the West in buildings which are not suited for the climate here. So it's refreshing to know that you're also, you know, the onus is being taken by the professional as well, right? it's not only by say you can't like shrug off responsibility and say that oh it's not coming to me or um this is what is required of me but there is a sense of wanting to expand on the awareness whether it's with the client or the marketplace or the audience um you know so it's not only about the creator and the consumer but it's also about the spectator in between exactly so Sanjay, i'm going to ask you uh, yeah Um, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm getting uh, comments after comments on social media saying why yes. Sanjay not expanding internationally, um, and why are you only stuck in India? So we had a lot of opportunities, but like you said, you know, so you were saying right, success and whatever. So we we had project and. in that slab of the first building it was a very interesting project complete sea view sit, sitting on a site which at the first time we had a site which had a 80 degree slope it was insane it was literally like building against a wall and all those complicated designs we did project started some investor backed out and project stopped in dallas we were about to start a project everything done contractor in place permissions and then the landlord had some problem and the project stalled so yeah there is bad luck well we hope we wish you luck and we hope that we can see you expand and you know take over the world little by little uh, but i know that you have to run so um if if everyone else is okay with it we can take some more questions and carry on the conversation in sanjay we can excuse you to have a more exciting saturday night if you can spare some more time and stay stick around with us of course we'd love that no i have to go i have to go it's a function sure but thank you so much for being thank here you. today and uh, we we really hope to see a lot more of you and we will catch you soon thank, thank you Alina. thank you sanjay great nice to meet you bye bye hope to do this in person yes soon yeah. bye akshar bye rashi bye bye sanjay thank you so much see you
So Rajshri and I, that's what we were discussing. That's the only thing that has been um, rather unfortunate about this whole thing is that we can't actually sit in a room with a glass of yes. wine in our hands and have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, we are locked be behind digital screens instead. Uh, of course, Rajshri, you know, sort of case case studies through uh, through documentation or case studies through physical experiences are more than encouraged. They're actually mandatory. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't design a five-star hotel without knowing what what is expected of you. Right? Yeah. You can't. Uh, so. I, th- I think there is this, uh, this you know, the, the 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 thing is that over the last 20, 20 years, the performance criteria in architecture has gone up significantly. So we can't be sort and and for the kind of clients that we're engaging with now, it's not random esoteric thoughts that you can have. I mean, there is those are encouraged, but you do need to know what you how things have to perform, how things have to work. Uh, so there isn't too much room for error. Right, and there is room. There is tremendous room for experimentation, uh, but that experimentation and prototyping happens on the drawing board, within a workshop, you know, through a through a through a three D printed model, through a physical model, or any such thing, uh, through simulation software, but uh, and even through a basic diagram or a or a drawing uh, and your thought process. But it's you know it's it's on a lower performance scale that you can afford to not have experience, but if I was to say today, I mean, we're doing, we're, we're fortunate enough. We're doing a lot of public work for, uh, for a for a community of people or a lot of communities that actually can't afford us unless the government hires us or unless it is through the through a community engagement. Even there, the performance criteria may not be as precise as that of a very fancy hotel or a or a or a or a wealthy person's home, but it's a performance criteria now that has to say every 10 rupees matters on this project because it has to be stretched for the next 25 years and it has to perform because this person will not have the ability to maintain it in the same manner as someone else so there are different levels of that right and you can't afford to to uh, to let the ball to drop the ball in a big way and i think that that's that's actually where i accept what sanjay and smita both said that if you don't do it if you don't stick your neck out and do it yourself someone else is going to do it badly Right. And we see those examples around us all the time. Uh, it's actually when we realized that we were performing well at the highest level, that we said, okay, can we be a bit like Robin Hood and start giving back to the masses, right? Because we never, nobody starts out saying, oh, I want to make the fanciest rich home or I want to make mm-hmm. the fanciest five-star hotel. You mm-hmm. start out with saying, you know, you want to do work for, for regular people, people that you can relate yeah. to yourself. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and it's never meant, I mean, the the entire organizational structure that of a contract that of a you know of a of a financial uh, uh, arrangement and all is just to supplement good architecture and your and, yeah. and the ability to run the studio we also whenever we can encourage um, you know sort of cpds uh, we'll send someone out be it abroad be it uh, out of station or whatnot to do a short program do a short course do a short sort of experience it's it's a way of giving back that is more i mean you know sort of thanking someone uh who's who's who's, who's uh, a few people or a, a person who's worked in the studio long enough or worked well and it's not never seen as it, it's not a contracted thing i know that often people say well it's a contract you you go study and we sponsor your study and you come back and you work with us no none, none of that just hey you know you've done a good job we can always give you a check as a bonus but you know let's just try mm-hmm. and think about you for a while it's and, also an uh, incentive right it's an incentive to to experience and grow. I mean, I believe growth, I've been yeah, fortunate. Yeah, incentive for growth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. which is important. Yes, I, I mean, I believe I've been fortunate, and and I would yeah. like to pass that on. It's not uh, whatever we are, we are, and 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 I mean, we're happy to be where we are uh, after twelve, thirteen years of. And I mean, value added the life of an individual in their career path, and I think that's amazing in itself. And I mean, at the end of it all, they are the assets of your 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 practice. So and yeah, you have to nurture those assets. And in fact, in lines of this, we got another question from social media, which talks about, um, you know, what is, the, what is the importance of qualifications when you're hiring people? So, of course, you're looking at passion and you're looking at their potential in terms of their personality. But are you going for somebody who is going to be highly qualified in terms of certification? Um, or is that something that, you know, you're willing to sort of negotiate with them during uh, their time working with you? Or is that is there like a hard fast rule? What is that? 
and i'm sure it'll be different it's different you know based on in context and based on uh, the location that you're in as well so if you could comment on those you know there are certain basics there is no question when you see certain qualifications because behind qualifications is an assumption of basic competence i think that's what you're looking at and that's why we seldom hire just on a resume you look at the portfolio and mm-hmm. you see the arc of development and then meet for us culture is absolutely everything because we are a team sport player if a person is collaborative plus we can see the fire in their belly to do more and better that's who we hire if and i think sanjay said that and akshat said that tools can be taught it's the attitude that cannot be taught if and you got to hire for the right attitude uh qualifications you know um so this is my own personal experience we've hired great architects and i worked with um architects or people who've trained at harvard and i have trained with people who don't even have an architectural degree and many times the a person who doesn't have the architecture degree in a particular area is far better than the person who went to harvard and this is my own personal experience so i take the uh, qualifications on a piece of paper with a pinch of salt all the other things have to be there uh but you are looking for some basic competence and i guess the qualifications um um you know apply only for that uh, just sure. to let you know one of our best site people is not even an architect but i would stake my life on him that he came with a referral and he's you know uh, through our experience he's proved himself so yes now it doesn't matter and i think but that's that's more true sure now than ever yeah. because yeah. you know yeah lines are kind of blurring and things blurring, are getting yeah. more fluid yeah. um yeah. so it's interesting that she is not a designer or an architect she's not yeah. professionally from this field but it's because of her um, sort of interest and passion mm-hmm. yeah, that she correct. continues to propagate and you know encourage people in this field and um on the other hand at the other end of the spectrum i'm a trained architect but i'm not practicing anymore and it's so we kind of yeah. you know we we kind of find our own ways and sometimes we discover sometimes we we don't find it and we continue to discover but it's becoming more and more possible to do these things now because you know people are becoming more accepting of it as well also yes. milalini i think uh, we'll have to tell the audience here and and darshit and uh, smita that the next conversation we are having on idea of architecture debate is on professional training versus education and this is precisely what you mentioned thank you for bringing it up and um, you know um, they are all important sometimes one more than the other you know as you you experience so watch watch for tune in for the next session as well yeah i think if you guys can will permit then we have a couple more questions to pick up um if you're not tight on time akshat and smita yeah sure go on i yeah, yeah i can see okay so i'm not sure who this question is aimed towards but somya jain on social media is asking that i agree that your past projects are your biggest business development tools but what do you do if your firm is fighting misconceptions i'm not sure what these so in brackets she says commercial expensive or international <laughs> that's us <laughs> <laughs> so well, uh, I'll let you take that. <laughs> so I I'll, I'll start with that um uh, I think you have to show up you have to talk and for us the people who go for the quote and quote pitch or for that initial meeting are the people who are going to stay with the project throughout. And you have to see if you can connect as people because in the end people will be working on the project there is no company that's going to come come on come and work on the project. um that's what you do and if you can make that personal connect beyond that because we are all of that we are international we are commercial you know that that label and we are expensive but we know that we can deliver the right solution so i think that's what you try and do okay thank you um actually do you want to add to that commercial yeah, I, expensive I, international i i need I, <laughs> i i didn't understand the question but i i can i think if the question is how can you break the shackles and sort of and 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 move in a different direction or uh, or such thing yes you can you started out from nothing and you are somewhere and then if you need to if you need to change direction or then you basically have to go back uh, not you don't have to go back to zero or square one but you have to you have to just step take a step back and say well you know this is the paradigm that that I that I succeeded in 
and i would like to now uh, i would like to now diversify and that's a, that's a you know it's an attitudinal thing more than a a commercial expectation you could uh, go to the extent of doing a project for free you know if you if you have to to demonstrate your ability to to do so and that's not that you're doing anything wrong it's just uh, creating provenance for yourself it's interesting i think sanjay also talked about this and he's he's actually mentioned this in in some of his uh, previous in, uh, interviews where he says that he had to move away from this whole development sort of uh, pigeon hole that he got caught in and he had to redefine his practice to be doing a lot of other diverse works um and it's interesting that you bring in this idea of doing free work because we have another question from vibhuti katpalia who says that what is the situation of pro bono work for government in india uh, do architects prefer it if yes then why and is it easy working with the indian government i have never tough time working with the indian government yeah okay. but you're not allowed to do I, pro bono I, work sorry yeah I, you know we i w- i personally was very keen on contributing to the rail uh railway design uh, piece and i'm uh, willing to do pro bono because we never win on a fee proposal uh to certain extent we were willing to do pro bono but you're right we, there was no avenue to do that i uh, also remember that you have to have i mean a when you're doing pro bono work is it an unfair trade practice i think that's a conversation mm. that one should have like is it an unfair trade practice and is, so you can do subsidized work right is is subsidized work is given to uh, is being done by a professional organization or individual that is qualified and capable and will do the best poss- is the best person for the job then there's nothing wrong with it i think the issue of um, you know the the issue becomes murkier when the project goes to someone who is not necessarily the best person for the job right? but isn't that uh, subjective who's to decide whether the person is is appropriate listen, the, or not unfortunately now there is a very there is, there is a very clear technical definition right Te- you know you have to if if i wanted to work for say the railways or if i wanted the pro- the parliament project i have to have the wherewithal to guarantee that i can deliver it right you're going to have to give your guarantee your logistics no akshay yes that, that is yours you're still addressing just the logistic part of it saying that okay you are a firm with x number of people you have the capability of mm-hmm. doing x number of you know work in x number of time but do you have the ability to deliver an ability of thought and practice to deliver what is required of the project isn't that the subjective part of it well look you have the capability that's how you have the provenance mm-hmm. um that's how you've done it all these years that's why you've got there that's why you've got to a point where you could do it mm. yeah the right. ability the quality i think you are addressing the qualitative nature of that and that is all that it can be subjective certainly but the basics have to be met which is what akshit is saying your provenance is your capability sure. that you've been able to do it and then after that it is subjective and you, you know what what are you going to do about that it's it is subjective somebody uh, you know a, a government official may see oh yeah somebody who was able to make the four walls stand up and it's functioning and that may be adequate they may not see the ad, uh, the added value of added good design etc yeah. also i think may i add that the public tendering process in india which is the you know the lowest bidder norm for government contracts i think that kind of is a bit of a um, stumbling block for really good work to to be executed you know i know niti ayog is trying to change that whole norm i'm not quite updated on what exactly they've been able to achieve so far wouldn't you agree akshat that is a bit of a limiting factor he's for mute. Yeah. Actually, he's on mute he's on mute if somebody can unmute him you, you know recently uh, rajshri i've seen uh, some things with 70% technical marks and 30% commercial marks okay which helps that uh firms like us still don't qualify but i think it there, that's a move in the right direction then it's not yeah. everything is not based on the lowest common uh, lowest yeah. yeah i i think i think that changed a while ago it's not just the lowest bidder it's uh, but a there is always there has to be a technical prov- a provenance for you to get a project so while it may sort of feel like you're trampling on a lot of ambition it's not just in india i mean i take you back to the raistag project that that tomen foster finally did the dome for yeah. but it was rumored that calatrava was the one who won the competition 
right? It was oh. like, yeah, camera trauma. But yeah. and then it goes on to and and if you were to sort of draw that analogy, and I know I'm being politically incorrect here, but when you look at what Santiago, how delayed and how over budget Santiago Calatrava's project for uh for for the you know for the underground station at uh, at uh, at uh, at ground zero was at new york then it just goes to prove a point so uh, the same applies for you know there was a rumor that it was a student from the architecture association that designed the dome the 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 vaulted roof over the british museum library but it actually went to foster and partners that time and foster partners actually sort of revived themselves because they suddenly won two three prestigious uh, commissions then but the and that brings me to the point that a studio has to deliver right yeah, today your architectural endeavors are far too uh, you know too delicate and too or too too prestigious and too significant to be entrusted onto some onto a system or a or a studio that has not proven themselves it may sound wrong you know but it's unfortunately the truth it is too expensive it's too precious you know our cities are important and while they may find a way to sort of get collaboration you know like if you look at say the nalanda project or any such you will see that there are studios that have proven themselves internationally con- uh, collaborating with studios that are from india to do a certain typology of work and there's nothing wrong with that yeah oh. again i think the architecture is you know one of those fabulous things that has to function so it has to be built it has to not leak um you know i'm sorry i will not hire peter eisenman i'm sorry um this should not i'm sorry i'm on uh, social media but his <laughs> buildings leak so you know you, you have to partner with the person who's going to make sure that this thing stands up it has to it has to it has to first emote and then it has to perform and you can't just stop at emoting right? you have to make it perform mm, it can't be just um, about that yeah So I'm going to go on to a couple of uh, fascinating questions. We actually have people who are Smita you you open the floodgates because now we've got people who are actually requesting for jobs and are literally <laughs> sending their portfolios into us on chat over here on Zoom. <laughs> um so I'm going to refrain from that for now. But um I would like to ask Akshat sir what your perspective for students while creating concept and vision for their thesis projects would be. uh can you give us some tips on doing a portfolio what actually do firms expect this is madan from insta so well now you'll just be talking about how to apply to each of your firms <laughs> be be yourself be be, yeah, be, I, be be concise and be yourself that's it yeah. you know and you know go beyond the surface that's what i would say what really interests you pick something that really interests you don't don't ask that question what do firms expect of you firms expect all of you your authentic self and each one can see offer something different yeah absolutely right? so it's not about being a cookie cutter sort of template right. Right. so i'm sorry but um, um, uh, amit has written a question has written something yes. to me a comment to say that uh, i'd actually that would not encourage newness newness and encourage a continuation of established firms only which i think is referring to my previous conversation mm-hmm. um look understand that i think it's it's not about architecture is not about only newness right like i said it has to first emote and then perform we've we are not at a point where architecture can only emote and i mean or you emote over a few pieces of paper and a model and not deliver so you have to tie up with the delivery making mechanism the reason why our cities are in shambles is because they have not i'm not saying i cannot absolve my uh, predecessors or or you know larger firms in india of or across the world of having missed an opportunity of course they have but that doesn't mean uh, and but the, and that doesn't mean we continue that uh, there is always going to be a quest for good architecture and good you know good design good delivery systems and we have to continually improve uh, that doesn't mean that it's only new studios that can do good work or new studios that can reinvent themselves there was someone who asked us a question for reinvention just a short while ago go into the history of studios such as well hey look at richard rogers partnership pre the welsh assembly and look at them now right? like look at richard rogers partnership is just that and then look at roger stark harbor right look at the, the 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 history of the studio so it's not like established studios cannot evolve and do something significantly different they do it's just that 
when they're delivering things that are not broken they're not sort of completely trashing them out they're just waiting on something else to happen that that's research and and so, frankly newness yeah. for the sake of newness i've never yes. you know fra- yeah. uh, the plazas uh, in our old cities are fabulous mm-hmm. we if we cannot do it better than that then let's stick with that so yeah. newness for the sake of newness doesn't make any sense to me we were having this conversation internally about the future of cities and we are doing a bunch of research and putting uh, some ideas together and we realized that the future of the cities may the future city may look very much like the city of the past because yeah. there were some things that worked so well mm-hmm. and in in the sake or in the uh, pursuit for newness sometimes we lost that and we need to reclaim that well also on yeah go ahead akshit sorry uh i also think that when i think when we look at uh, architectural endeavors in the public realm then there is a lot of responsibility i mean it is it's fine to engage uh, you know it's probably okay to engage at smaller scale or with uh, with individual or even smaller organizations or well organization of any scale when it's not public money but the moment you are engaging in the public realm there is a certain there is a weight to that engagement because now public space has to it's not okay for public space to last only 10 years public space has to perform for 50 years 100 years those are the ones that you and uh, uh, that you and us embrace those are the ones that we remember right if you look at central uh, vista or central delhi now it's 100 years old it survived that time there was a certain dev, and 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 they were you know at the time that uh, latin and baker were delivering that charles jane mackintosh was doing the macintosh school right like look at what was really happening like corbusier was just about getting into uh, doing the first domino right uh, so look at that you know th- there is that shift uh, but it, it was interested because it has to survive uh, i i think um it's it's few and far between that you will see uh, young like absolutely fresh out people deliver and by the way the the, the international sort of standard and we were having this conversation earlier for a young architect is 45 years right you <laughs> need to have graduated and have done something for a certain amount of years and then you're still young at 45 right. so i'm that's I'm exactly young. right yeah. young. <laughs> I, i like how you're um, a baby your your by the way your standards have gone from 40 to 45 within a span of an hour yeah. a- internationally <laughs> internationally it's 45 in india 35 <laughs> so by india standards you're old and you're done with <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's well. Whatever the standards are, they're established by publication, right? I think I think we were having that conversation earlier also yeah. about publication and awards and whatnot. Yes. But yes. I forgot to say that it, I, you know there was a time when there were only so few, and today there are so many. Yeah. And you know, and so we, how do you pick? And well, anyway, that's a conversation another day. Um, I, we actually have a lot of younger sort of um, uh, audience that are coming out of school and are wanting to establish their own practices. So we're getting a lot of comments and questions from them. and someone asks about this whole idea of innovation right where uh, especially as a new architect or a new professional you are you feel the pressure to innovate to prove yourself and by innovate you more often than not are talking about an original idea or again coming back to the idea of, of doing something new so how do you overcome that and how do you again when you're starting off on your own how do you did you go through this process where you had to big projects that were coming your way so that you could earn the money to sustain your practice and then sort of do works on the other end that were not necessarily paying but would um, sort of satiate your or indulge or you would be able to indulge in your curiosities smita <laughs> well i didn't go that route so for me it was very important to build a foundation mm-hmm. and i uh, since i was uh, trained here i didn't have that opportunity to go out and put my placard uh, out there not that i was at, uh, tempted to do that here we finish school uh, in the us and then we have to go through uh, the registration yes. architectural registration which takes uh, you know there's a period of apprenticeship which i completely believed in and by the time i you know went through that period i found that i'm much better as a part of a collective and um, you know once i found a sort of a spiritual home i did not have this temptation to 
put Smita Gupta Architect out there because I felt I can do it as part of the firms that I was uh, participating. I was learning so much that I did not have that temptation. And to this day, now I could, but I don't have that temptation because I I think uh, I what I can contribute, I do much better as part of a team mm. than as me individually. And if I can bring all my ideas to that and that they shape the project in the right way, only the good ones will survive. So the best ideas can come from many different places. It takes professionals and experienced professionals to pluck the right idea and put it in the right place in the right proportion. And that's why Akshat's right. At 45 years or with that much uh, experience behind you, that's when you know what is a good idea. Because newness for newness sake, I just said, is an innovation. If it is not really making something better, it's just uh, it's just a... Um, it's a it's folly. Pointless. It's an architectural yeah. folly. So, Akshat, I think you've been down this road, so you can maybe answer it more directly. Look, I, I think, I think I had the good fortune of being of working for a few very, very good architects at a younger at my in, in at a young age. So, I first worked with Anand Prasad, then I worked with, and I had zero experience of a studio before I went abroad. So, I never made this. I never did the one month internships or sort of mm-hmm. trips to architecture studios. I I was sort of because that one month I'd rather spend sort of playing the guitar and I actually encourage people to that like travel you know experience the world experience yes. your country you don't have to just be a one trick pony sort of stick in there and sort of mm. learn some new architectural skill I, I think that just sort of destroys it all um, the second is I think I think don't succumb to some sort of financial pressure because trust me the the entrepreneurial journey is not a pleasant one and it's fraught with danger so you'd much rather have that safe but lower earning architects job, which is at least teaching you, right? So therein it becomes important to choose the studios that you want to work with and be sort of dogged about it and be committed. Um, so you have to sort of spend at least three to four to five, three to five years to sort of understand studios and you need to go through a couple of scales of work uh, over a few years. Um, and a significant number of years before you can before you really have a voice, right? Um, a significant enough voice. Um, if you even look at Corbusier's earlier works and go up, go back in the book, see what he was doing for the first fifteen years of his life. It was just, it was thoughts. just, just, just copying what was already, or just repeating what was. It was repetition. It was learning through repetition. So, and that's also the old saying, right? A good copy is better than a bad invention, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you go, so you go down that path. Um, and finally, for me, because I had worked with a with Pradhan Prasad and then with Jeff, and then finally when I came to India, I was very for a very short, brief period of time, actually just about two months, I tried a commercial firm that's called Morphogenesis, which I, I didn't think I fit in. And then I, uh, I, you know, then 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 I started working with Virin, which was about four years. So I think I cut my teeth, uh, I cut my professional teeth with Virin and. He was my guinea pig or I was his guinea pig, whatever, we, 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 we still debate that. But I was a reluctant starter right? and that's why it's not, you know, Atelier Akshat Bhatt or whatever. That's why it's architecture discipline because I always wanted the studio to be beyond me, uh, which by the way, I'm, I'm, I, can, I, can, I can happily say over the last year or so, whenever I've gone out, people have heard of the studio, but they haven't heard of me. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, oh, you know, but I found so I have to sort of use the studio name and the provenance for myself. You know, I founded it, uh, which is which is nice to to have to you know to have got to a certain point with. But you know, I would really, really resist and discourage people from starting out on their own early on. I start out when you you know you when you're when you when you've done. When you you know when you sort of learnt it, when you're critical enough with your contribution, this and do not innovate. I mean, we really, really <laughs> resist innovation. We want to. We, it's just for the sake of it, right? We look. We are critical of what a program is doing. We're critical of what a, a typology or a morphology is doing to try and make it achieve more. But you have to first understand what it's achieving before you can make it achieve more. Right? If you don't understand it. Then how can you do it? Yeah. And that's I, why I, case studies yeah. are important, you know. And, yeah. and 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 but you can't just do it through case studies because you don't know what that wall section is. You don't know how it's going to perform. Mm. You you know, unfortunately, in India, we pay very little importance to the physics of building. Yes. Right, building physics as a science. 
you need to know it and unless you know that you can't deliver it it's not just about fancy shapes and and, and expensive material you know architecture is about a lot more than that it has to move the human spirit but it also has to give you health and safety